we start talking about a test. So, I'm glad I said that because it reminded me. The way I'm going to do tests this semester is going to be different because in the past you walked in with your computers, we did a monitored test. But I think to make up some time, I'm going to allow you to take the test on your own. But because of that, because it's a test, it has to be monitored. So I'd love to do it like the quiz, which is fairly open, but it, it just it could be too, pro, too tempting, right, to be wanting to cheat and stuff on that. So what we do with the test, we have what's called a lockdown browser and a webcam. So you have to have both of those enabled on your computer. You go to take the test, it literally is videotaping you, and then if you're, if you're acting strange, like the screen empties all of a sudden, then I'm gonna get flagged on my end. And later I'll look at the video and go, oh my gosh, you were gone for five minutes. Can you explain that behavior in the middle of a test? Right? So it's very weird, but you have to kinda, we have to play that game. Now, if that gives you trouble and you're taking a test, it's gonna be a nightmare. True? So I have a little mini test. It says two silly questions. I think I asked about my favorite college basketball team, the Jayhawks, just in case you want extra credit. <laughs> no, that's where I got my degree. So yeah, I'm a rock jock Jayhawk. But is that Baker, like in, like right in Kansas? Yes, but my sister probably Okay, so that's so weird because since this is the same context. It's like a stone's throw from Lawrence. Yeah, and I, I mean, I taught high school in that town for just a minute. So. so the town is called Baldwin City. So I thought it was Baldwin City. I was like, my gosh, I got to live there. It's like, it's made for me. Anyway, I'm sorry, I got, I got distracted. But take the lockdown browser quiz and just make sure everything's working, playing nice with your computer, and then let me know if there's problems now. So as soon as you can, just take it. Just it's it's you'll see it it's at the top of your assignments just and there's two questions and just and the whole point is does everything work nice and we can start troubleshooting at, well before we get to the test does that make sense mm -hmm. yeah that was the main commercial I got distracted and went down the whole road ignore all the Baldwin and the Baker and the Kansas just get the quiz done that's important <laughs> aye, aye, aye. okay focus yes yeah, so your exam will have a calculator. It'll have certain sheets that are definitely given to you. The first one will have polyatomic ions. Mm -hmm. I think it's worth your time to memorize them so your brain works better around them. But I'll give you certain. I'll give you certain things. At times you'll even have access to the book. I'll let you know that. I'll let you know exactly what you need prior to. So could we use our notes? I'll let you know. Okay. Yeah, I'll let you know what we're going to do on that first one. Okay, you ready? So we're going to now work on electron structure, so you have a sense for counting electrons. Saying, look, if you're neutral, how do the protons compare to the electrons? If the charge is neutral, how do the protons compare to the electrons? If I have a carbon charge zero, how many protons? I mean, how, well, how many protons? It's carbon. Six. Six. How many electrons? Six. Six, if it's neutral. Follow what I'm saying? All right, now what we're gonna talk about is where those electrons are found, okay? So basically what we kind of have visualized is it's not just a sphere in space around that central atom. It's more like these energy levels that are unique. So it's more like, you can kind of think of it rooms of a hotel where the electrons live. Now the, the rooms closest to the nucleus, right, carry less electrons because they're just less size. And as you get farther out, they carry more and more electrons. You follow? And that's gonna be real important to how they act. Okay, so basically what we have is the first level row on the periodic table fills up with two electrons. Now, what I mean by that is I can take I can take advantage of the table, even though these refer to protons. Everybody's aware of that, right? That is, <coughs> hydrogen has one proton. Helium has two protons. But if you had a neutral hydrogen, it would also have one electron. Mm -hmm. And if you had a neutral helium, it would have two electrons, correct? So I'm going to cheat a little bit and go, I'm going to I'm going to pretend I'm using these numbers to count electrons, which is which works for what I'm about to show you. So in other words, 
every atom, its very first electron, number one, is found in the first shell closest to the nucleus. And the second electron is found in the, and here's how it works, these are the shells. Second shell, third shell, fourth shell, fifth shell, okay? That's generally how they work. That's generally how they work. So, the first two, all that I can stop in the first shell is two electrons. You see how I was doing that on the table? I'm saying one and two are found on the first row. That's the first shell, so that's the place I'd find the first two electrons in every structure. Tracking? Okay. Other levels tend to fill up with eight. And, and what I mean by that is if I go to the next level and I count across, how many do I count? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, okay, then I get to the third shell. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Track it with me. Now you can go, now when I get to the next shell, I kind of have a little bit more, a little bit more electrons, obviously, above eight. Correct? I'm just going to leave it at that for right now. That we won't visit so much. We'll get back to that a little later. Okay, but this is the important part I want to show you because the bulk of where you live and everything you do, like the human body, right, the, the teeth and the mouth, it's all pretty much built off these first three rows anyway. It's all carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. A little calcium, right? Got to throw that in there. But it's pretty much that concept. And that's true of most like or, what we call organic chemistry. Now with that in mind, we're just going to kind of keep that in mind. More shells, bigger atom. Make sense? So if I said, hey, who's bigger? Chlorine or fluorine? So look at there on the table. Chlorine number 17 or fluorine number 9? Who's bigger? Chlorine. Chlorine. It has more shells. It's bigger in volume. Agreed? Now, I'm trying to think of how we could how we could do this. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna have you be a, do some, you'll be the atom. You ready? Okay. Okay. Here's here's inner shell electrons. So this is like one and two on the first shell. That's closest to the him. Correct. Then the next shell electron number uh, where are we at three. It's like this. We'll borrow that. It's farther out. Agreed. Does that make sense? So this is tucked away close to the nucleus. This is farther out. Now, we're about to do some chemistry together. I'm not going to touch that electron because this is what I come to first, correct? Okay, thanks. So that outer, outermost shell electrons are the ones that react. Those are called valence electrons. So they're what's relevant. So now, with that in mind, I can kind of use that trick and go, oh, 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 oh. So sodium has how many electrons in its third shell? Okay, how many in the first shell? Two. Two. How many in the second shell? Eight. 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 Third shell? Eight. eight. One. One. Now, isn't it, isn't it, that's the outermost electron, right? That's the valence electron. Isn't it interesting that if it was to lose one, the one hanging way out there, the one that gets picked off, like the the cow hanging out on the edge with the wolves coming by like, I'm getting the one right on the edge, right? I'm not jumping in the middle with the whole herd. No, thank you. You with me? Well, what charge does that family take? Plus one. It loses one electron. It's the exposed part. See, do you see how that, see it's all related, right? It's the outermost shell. Those are called valence electrons. Yeah. So up to eight are in the outer levels, or is it like, like lithium has three electrons? Yeah, yeah, so we can we can actually look at the element itself. So let's talk about silicon for a okay. second. We're focusing on number 14. Sure. We're going to the outermost shell, which is shell number three. Yeah. Agreed? Yeah. And then it has one, two, three, four. It 
has four electrons in its outermost shell. So if we use the example of lithium, has if it's stable, it has three electrons. Does that mean there's two electrons in the inner shell and one hanging out in the second shell? Yep. And which one are going to interact in the reactivity? Yeah, the, the, the one. And what charge does lithium tend to take? Uh, one. One. Plus because one. it lost that one electron. Mm -hmm. Now watch. Beryllium has how many in its outermost electron? Uh, outermost shell, sorry. Two. two. Well, that's what's that's exposed. Two. That's what it tends to lose if it's going to lose any. Those are called valence electrons, and they're going to be pertinent because that's the kind of chemistry that stuff does is based on the outermost shell electrons. So let's do this together. Let's just do a little counting. You ready? We're going to count valence electrons. Pretty simple, actually. How many valence electrons does hydrogen have? One. Yeah, so you guys can give me, you can just give, use your hands and show me. Hey, by the way, use the first finger, don't use the middle finger. Okay, how many, okay. <laughs> how many electrons does hydrogen have? One, thank you. Unless you're really mad at me. That's okay. I don't know. <laughs> how many, uh, if you're really mad at me, how many electrons does helium have? Two, peace, right? Have some peace. Come on, don't be so mad. Make sense? Okay, how many electrons does the element boron have in the outermost shell? So count over. What do you see? Make it sense? Does that make sense? And that's the kind of chemistry that boron ha does. It tends to bond to three things. Follow? That's valence electrons. Now, if I followed this out, and I got, you can get really kind of more complicated about that, and it's okay. It's not, it's nothing that will throw you off. Even these more abundant ones like this, like a lot of electrons, you still just count over one, two, three, four, five, six, seven valence electrons. It's a lot. So really, if I was to show you the full thing on valence electrons, it would be like this. As long as you do the first three rows, just count your way across, you're going to be correct. On these next rows in here, count your way across all the way up to here. So, you know, how many does this have? Three. How many does this have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? All the way up to here, how many does this have? Ten. You just count your way across, right? The only catch is when I get to these again, when I jump, I ignore the middle. I know, a little complicated, but. So, so if I go to gallium, I just basically jump and go one, two, and jump over and go three. If I'm doing 10, I would go one, two, jump over and go two, three, four. And that's it. Now you've got the whole table. That's valence electrons. And by the way, 10, four is a, is a thing like 104 10 fluoride you you know what we call stannic fluoride that's what that's a real thing <coughs> how are we doing kind of got it I mean it just takes some practice but basically I can look up and go okay how many does I'm gonna do three of them get your get your table or chart out I'm gonna try a few okay hey, it's electron that's all I want you to count Magnesium, I'm going to do a little sulfur, and then I'll do one with the hard jump. Just tell me how many valence electrons you think these things have. Make sense? Three, now, four. again, it's Everybody not just a little stuff. like a puzzle. It's, a, it's like it has an application. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I could say magnesium, whatever it does, it involves two electrons. The charge it takes is plus two. Uh, sulfur can bond possibly the six things. I'll show you more about that later, but you have that idea. That's kind of the, the idea. Does everybody got that? So what we've decided as we count then is, I just keep 
I keep moving stuff more and more in here. But by the end of the lecture, this will be piled up with stuff, and I'll be like, where are my markers? All right, so magnesium has two. Agreed? One, two. Sulfur, if I count all the way over, I gotta keep going. One, two, three, four, five, six. Antimony, see it number 51. So I'm gonna start counting. 37, 38, then I jump all the way over to 49, 50, and 51. So that has five. Cool? That's the thing. It's good. Venus electrons. So now I'm kind of just kind of showing you, right? If you go up to here all the way to neon, right, it would feel like this. I put two in that first shell. I put the other eight in the next shell. That's what I'm showing up there, right? And that's where it kind of would be located. And this is the chemistry I'm able to do is based on this. Okay? Good stuff. I got up to neon. Okay, now I'm going out to the next shell, right? I'm out in here. There's lithium. See it? I'm out in this third shell. One, two, three shells. The first electron, that's lithium, number three. Could it be lithium? I mean, sorry, sodium, number 11. Sorry. It's way off. That's sodium, number 11. And then you just keep going. There's magnesium and on and on. Okay, so trends on the periodic table. I'm gonna just show you a couple of those. We've already worked on one. How does size increase as you move down a family? Bigger or smaller? Bigger, and that's what we call atomic radius. It's kind of like the how big the radius is, how big the atom is. It's misleading because not every atom is shaped like a basketball but that's the general idea. So, now there is one catch to this though. This is kind of different. So as we go down, we know it's getting bigger, more shells. Mm -hmm. But going left to right and right to left is a little bit surprising. So now we're gonna, now we're gonna stay in this shell and we're gonna move left to right and right to left, okay? And it's something called effective nuclear charge, all right? The, the contraction, happens because the proton grabs the electron and pulls it in. Agreed? So one way you might visualize this is the thing pulling in these electrons is a plus two charge. The things being pulled on is a minus two charge. Plus two and minus two pull harder than plus one minus one. And there's more force. So that is what, and, and remember this is not, my picture's not right. It's generated from a small positive center. So you can imagine as you get more protons in the po small positive center, it gets more and more positive in nature and it starts to pull in these electrons. Unless they literally have a physical jump into the next shell. That's called effective nuclear charge. What does that mean? Well, what it means is, size-wise, we're gonna go from sodium, see at number 11, to magnesium, to aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, we're moving like that, it's getting smaller. So argon is actually smaller than chlorine. So in that row, from 18 to 11, 11's the biggest. So that's different. But for me, this is very easy to do. I just simplify it like this. This is my periodic table. You like it? It's beautiful. I'm just gonna put. No. Oh yeah. It's it's. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do size with an arrow. So we know that this is increasing, right? Because more shells. And then all I'm gonna do is this. That's bigger. Bigger and bigger. So I can compare any two, pretty much any two atoms, and tell you which one's bigger. So who's bigger, 31 or 32? Which one's the bigger atom? 31. 31. Pretty simple. Now what does that have to do with anything? Well, if I think metals, 
And I got, I got all these metals I'm working with, and I'm going, okay. When I start in zirconium and I start moving this way, I'm going smaller or larger? From zirconium to silver, which one's bigger, silver or zirconium? Zirconium's bigger, correct? Mass-wise, this is not, vo that's volume. Mass-wise, which has more mass? Silver. So you now have a denser metal as you move to the right, right? It's smaller and more massive. And that has implications for the kind of, you know, the density has to do with where it might be applied. You probably want dense materials if they're showing up in your mouth. You don't want loose. They have to be able to take a lot of force. Sort of that, that sort of idea. Other things, you know, if you're a fisherman, you, you know, right, you want to throw, I see your fishing hat there. Right, you want to throw lead to pull the bait down. You don't want some, some, something light. It might be cool, but it may not be very heavy. Is everybody okay? And then once you add a new, uh, once you add that new shell, then it pops back up again. It starts getting bigger, and that's right. So I go, all right, hydrogen, helium. Now, even though I'm going back to the left because I've added a shell, it grows up. I mean, in all ways, it grows up. Changes the shell and goes left, so it's getting big. Then, then you go across and get small, small, small. Jump a shell and gets big. So, there's your first periodic trend. You can tell me which has the biggest size, but you've also learned which charges things tend to take. There's a lot you can do on that table, and write all over your table. It's your table, so write what you want. It's getting bigger to the left, bigger as you go down. It's good memory, right? So just kind of trying to show how even simple crystals might grow in size based on what they're made from. Um, also, this is like in the body, right? You might have something that passes potassium. Now I look on the periodic table. Is it? But it may, so let me reword that. Let's say it passes sodium, which is very small. It's not going to necessarily pass potassium because it's a little bigger, all right? And that is a reality of, like, one side of your muscle uh, has sodium and one's more potassium laden. Sometimes people, they lose that potassium piece. So they get kind of charge built up on one side and that muscle just goes into spasm and you're like, oh my gosh, I just got cramps. So what do they tell you? Go eat a banana, why? Because I need more potassium, right? Or take some Gatorade, because I need more potassium. Right, so you have charge balance on across the cell walls. So this is kind of this is something that some fancy chemists out of Dupont figured out. Is they made these things that bound these ions specifically. They're called crowns. These are carbons and oxygens, and what they do is they're specifically sized to bind onto those. So they could pull sodium out of a solution specifically, and it would leave the potassium alone. Or it might take potassium because it binds it so nicely and ignore the sodium. So these are just kind of why you would care about size. And if you think about size, it has to do with bonding strength. Right? Because remember, the, pe the positive is in the center. And the positive has to reach out and grab this negative. That's how these things bond. If it has to reach through more space, the bond is weakened. Is that making sense to everybody? Just general electrostatics, right? Just kind of, that's a fancy word. But it works, let's see, works like a magnetic field. You would understand that. So I'm using mag a magnetic field, but it's the same, same as true if it had been an electrical field, right? And so here's what I know. As you have a longer distance, there's less force field. But if I get closer and closer, then that field strengthens, 
right? So basically, I'm just saying, look, if you have to reach that through a longer space, the bond's going to be weaker, hmm. and opposites attract. Like charges repel, and that same principle would be, be true if you have repelling forces, which is kind of fun, too. Oh, okay, anyway. <laughs> Good? Make sense? Okay. In fact, there's the energy it takes to break two things apart. Sure enough. This takes less energy because it has to move over. So that's where size would matter. And so this is the fancy physics way of doing what I just explained to you. The force of electricity is charge one times charge two. There's a constant in there divided by radius squared. <coughs> if the distance is growing like this is, or, so imagine this, it was two to begin with. I'm dividing by four. Now it's 10, 10 squared, I'm dividing by 100. It's making this less and less the farther apart things are. But by the same token, this is what I was also saying about charge, right? Where I was talking about effective nuclear force. And I'm saying, hey, if you have more positive charge in the center, like how does the lithium 3 plus compared to a sodium, right, 11 plus, then you could imagine whatever has more charge has more attraction. So that's what that's all about. Nothing you need to memorize. It's just, it's just helpful. Good old. Larger atoms lose valence electrons easier. Because I can pull this electron out here off the positive center a lot easier than I can from this little lithium in close. Correct? Now that also means, in terms of metals, metals want to become positive. That means the most active metals are the big metals. So if I looked on these metal chart, I'd go, oh, if I go the same thing, I'm going to go size. So if I go to the left and down, I'm getting to the most active metals. So that's kind of that business. Now, going the other way, right now I'm sucking electrons in, you'd go, okay, then the smallest nonmetals are the most active. Because they're trying to pull electrons in, that's what nonmetals do. So if I'm thinking about the most active nonmetals, I go to the right and up. Fluorine is the most active nonmetal. Because it's small, so it's easy to go, just like what you saw here, when things get small, that force gets strong, right? If there's large, yeah, I don't see any force, but if you can get small, that force starts to take over, right? It's very strong when you get close. So small atoms have a lot of attractive force. So that's kind of that business. So, see what I'm doing? Now I'm going to just generalize. So you can put this on your chart. If I'm thinking about metal reactivity, what's the most active? I would go like this. This way. So I'm saying this way. And yeah, this is the same thing as size. Most active metals. And then I just, why do I ignore this column? Because they don't do any reactivity. They're noble. I don't react. I'm too good. But I say, most active non-metals. So if you put fluorine next to cesium, you'd have a party. I don't know if I do videos of this. I think I might have some on here. But. So far, so good? Is that kind of making sense? And there's fun, I, I don't know if I activated these at the time, but some videos of that, I don't know if I go back to it later, but this is kind of, this is pretty cool. It might be. Let's do it. Yeah. When the stakes are high at work, your tone matters. Grammarly. There we go. Okay. Here I'm working with some lithium metal, very difficult to cut. 
I've got a piece of sodium here, pretty easy to cut. And you notice when I cut through that, that the fresh sodium is very shiny compared to the rest. This is a little more quick, let's see if we can really get in there. So, this side will reflect a lot of light. The other sides are pretty dull. And you'll see that especially with the potassium here. I'm gonna go ahead and give this kind of a half cut. So for the potassium, this is the side that's been freshly cut and you can see the dullness to the other sides compared to that one. So I'm gonna go ahead and take those three and I'm going to add them to water and we can look at the kind of reactivity of those three alkali metals with water. Which one's most reactive, guessing? Lithium, sodium, potassium? So here we're gonna take a look at it. Potassium, and we're gonna about to find out. Generate hydrogen gas. All right. Comes and lithium. lithium hydroxide. So you're gonna see a pink color develop here. And then you're gonna see some smoke come off and that's either lithium metal or that's lithium hydroxide coming off of there. He put Maybe the a little bit in. of liquid water. It's an indicator, that's not normal. It's, but it's, it's not, not as a, reactive as say sodium. So I'm it's sodium getting basic. The, the water is getting basic, so it's making it pink. But it's just showing. Yeah, it's pretty reactive though. It hits water. And sodium is actually probably going to ignite. Oh. Get a little spark. So you'll see some orange flame, perhaps, or some sparks, or some shrapnel. A little more reactive. So far, so good. And the last one, I'm going to go ahead and put my two pieces of potassium in. One for two, good to go. Cut in half. Yeah. So this is less potassium than the other two. In terms of amount, you'll find that the reactivity is a little bit Oh, weird. oh yes. Uh, <laughs> it's awesome. Good demo. chemists, you know, you keep some of that stuff around and do demos with it, but it's super dangerous. <laughs> so you got to keep it under oil all the time, because if it gets exposed to the moisture in there, it'll do what you just saw. So that's that's hydrogen gas coming off there, so it'll pretty dangerous. All right, cool. And there's a little video on the reactivity of the halogen family, too. If, you, if you're watching this yourself on your file, you can click that and you'll get a video. Not quite as dramatic, so I won't, I won't waste your time. It's more thinking. That's good. So if I got this, kind of got the trend, you know what I'm doing with this? So I can just ask you a question. Hey, which is the more active metal? Uh, chlorine or phosphorus? What do you think? 17 or 15? 15. 17, right? Chlorine. Make sense? Chlorine. And of the halogens, right, what do you think is the most active? Uh, by the way, that's the halogen family. I'm just referring to Family nine, all those down there sometimes we call refer to as the halogens. This whole family. And we know we like to put fluorine in the water to help us with teeth, right? But which one's the most reactive? Fluorine or bromine? Fluorine, yeah. That's cool. Alright. Now, next thing I'm gonna start showing you a little bit with this with this valence electrons. I'll show you kind of a neat trick. This is called Lewis theory. This guy got very simple with this. So he's looking, look at the family, so look on your table and see what he's doing. He's boron number three, carbon, see it? Nitrogen, you with me? And then he's saying how many valence electrons? Boron has three, carbon has four, that tracking? So he's just working down the table. So of those, which is the most stable? Which is the one that's not reactive out of that whole row of crust? Is it neon? So I would start to say boron, between boron and fluorine, correct, that's the, but what, there's even one above that though, which one is it? Boron was right based on the trend, right? But what about neon, what do we know about neon? adds a noble gas, right? So it, it's not reactive at all, right? So out of these, this is the least reactive, but then you're right, then it would be like this, then this, then this, and this, right? These are the, this is the least reactive. 
So least reactive means most stable. Most stable. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Least reactive is most stable. That's a great question. Sometimes you assume that's obvious, but it's not always. Okay. And here's another way of looking at it in terms of energy. If I say it's more active, but it's got more energy in it, right? So this actually has a lot more energy in it, and it'll it'll react <coughs> more than this will react. Right? And that's another way of saying that this is more stable, this is more active. Okay? So that's kind of how that works. So here's what Lewis had in his head. He said, hey, neon, the stable thing, the things that things tend towards have eight. So he did something very simple. He just said, okay, I'm going to take this, this atom structure and I'm just going to think, I don't care what the symbol is, I'm just going to put. I'm going to put four sides on it. And each of these four sides can hold two electrons. So, you know, if I was talking about neon, I would go, all right. And when I put the electrons on, I go, I don't put two on one side before I put one on each. So I'm, I'm going to put eight on. You ready? One on each side. Two, three, four. That's my first four electrons. I put them all on each side. And then I finish up by duplicating, right? That's when I start to fill. And he goes, here's one way to think about those eight electrons. You can just kind of put them, space them around this thing, just like this. Okay? And it has all sorts of chemical content in it, none of which you necessarily have to know if you understand Lewis dot theory. It's pretty simple. So, now, Helium's unique because it only holds two. It's on the inner shell, correct? So if I did helium, it'd be very simple. It's not like this. It doesn't get the A. I'd just be going like this for helium, right? That's it. Or hydrogen. It's the same. I don't really have four sides available. I only have one. Tracking with me? It's pretty simple. It's, it's as simple as it seems right now. It's that simple. Ions strive to be noble. I had to throw out a noble lady. Being Sophia of Thailand. She runs the show. Thailand would be fun. Food's phenomenal. I think it's very cheap. I need to go to that. Anyway, side note. Here we go. So here we go. One valence electron, two. I'm just counting valence electrons. You with me? Now I'm going to do it with. Now I'm going to do Lewis Dotton. One electron. Easy enough. Helium. That's not really fair. I should put it on top because it only has one shell. So I kind of messed that up. Very simple. I've already messed up. Lithium. One dot. Beryllium. One, two. With me. Boron. Two, three. I'm going to stop right now because this is so simple, but I want you to understand something. It's, it's really cool. Boron tends to make three bonds. This is a very common compound of boron. Lewis predicted that because he said, look, you've got three unpaired electrons spread out around the atom. It'll bind. The chlorine has one to share. Right? So he... His theory was actually really strong. Carbon, how many electrons should I put around it? Four. Man, I can draw carbon all day long, and everything I draw has four bonds on it. In fact, I don't. I can't think of a carbon compound that doesn't have four bonds on it. Maybe more. Do you see what I'm saying? So he was. That's why this is so powerful. Now, here's what he found out too, though. If I follow this, where does the next electron go? It pairs, and these are no longer available for bonding. So ammonia, the compound tends to bond to, or, sorry, nitrogen, the element tends to bond to three things. You with me? And it has this unparalleled set of electrons that are not bound, just hanging out on it. Oxygen. Let me see on your board what you come up with. Oh, 
Right? How many things do you think oxygen bonds to? Two. Two. What's the structure of water? Oxygen bonds to two things. What is hydrogen bond to? One thing. Oh. See what we're doing? H bonds in like this. H bonds in like this. Then I have these unpaired electrons. That's the structure of water. Oh, Lewis knew what he's doing. I mean, it seems so super simple, but he was like, oh man, I can kind of predict the structure of molecules. Right? Now, fluorine. Can I see on your board what you come up with with fluorine? Cool. Making sense? How many things do you think fluorine will bond to based on what you're showing me? One. And then it has like three pairs of unpaired electrons, right? And that's very true of fluorine. So I think about HCl, that's, or HF. And I go, oh yeah, fluorine with all of its electrons hanging out over here has one electron to share with, oh yeah, structure of HF. See what he's doing? It's really simple but really powerful. And he's right about this, that fluorine is very electro, it has all these free electrons that actually do some funky stuff. Like this acid juice through glass because of all those free electrons and them being so tight and small. Very weird stuff. All right. Neon. Dotted it up. Looks very much like fluorine, except you just pop one or more. How many things is neon going to bond to? Nothing. And that's why the noble gases are unreactive. They have no unpaired electrons to start doing bonding. Good stuff? Awesome. Lone pairs, we call them lone pairs, so here's terminology. Lone pairs are non-bonding electrons. Unpaired are bonding electrons. So these are lone pairs, these are unpaired. Neon has four lone pairs. Boron has three unpaired. Oxygen has two unpaired, two lone pairs. Kind of weird because unpaired refers to one electron, lone pairs refers to two electrons. So just kind of track with that. Pay attention to that. Good stuff. I'm just picking out the lone pair. The lone pairs there, right? Highlight them for a second. Do some more. <coughs> up. Let's see if we can do these real quick. And I could ask you some questions about how many things they'll bond to as well. Thank you. 
nosotros somos personas que no nos queremos en junta con nadie. La razón por la cual no se junta con nadie no es porque está en esta primera que no tiene de dónde de un día. And the reason why I got confused is because he was saying this one, two, three, and then like six. No, that's only aquí abajo. So los únicos que tiene que cuentan que que cuentan es la primera, segunda y tercera línea. Aquí se está brincando de uno a dos porque si te fijas están por eso están con estos de aquí no cuentan. Esto de aquí del centro no cuenta. Pero cuenta de aquí donde están los cromos. Eso es uno, dos, no cuenta nada. Tres, cuatro, cinco. Seis, siete, ocho. Uh -huh. Que es lo mismo, pero esto no cuenta de aquí donde. They don't know if it reacts. No. It doesn't. Why don't they react? No, they react, pero no es como de ellos leen la reacción. No es de vos. No es de vos. No es de vos. Ok. Alright, you guys look good. Now. I'm gonna I'm gonna just ask around the room just some over on the far side if you can tell me how many things should silicon bond to then based on what you've drawn. Yeah, she gave me the secret signal. Four. <laughs> that's correct. It's like we're playing football. Like Pond, run. No. Okay. What do you guys think about phosphorus? How many things would it bond to? Three. Good. And I'm going to get up there. Let me get up there. So here's your silicon, four, correct? And then you said phosphorus. We think three. If I went around with my five, perfect. What do you guys think uh, about sulfur? How many things is sulfur going to bond to? Two. Two. Good. I have two lone pairs bond to two things. Perfect. All right. Good. So you guys have the idea really important. And on we go. Now, so I got a couple more of these. It's using only the periodic table. Rank each set of main group elements in order of decreasing atomic size. In other words, put the first one, the big one first, and then organize the other ones. So I got calcium, magnesium, and strontium. Who's the biggie? And then just descending size. This is volume, not mass, by the way. Volume, not mass. That's size this way, not how much it weighs. Because weight is the bottom of the table. Remember we did that last time we were together? And that's different. That's very simple, right? Just read it like a book, and they get bigger and bigger. Which one's one of those bugging you? Tell you what, we've got about, let's take a 10 minute break. When you guys get, you can either finish now or take a break, come back, and then when you get back, we'll just kind of show you what we got to work with. But if you want, take a break, come back, take 10 minutes, and then we'll see how these guys. SR? Yes, Calcium, strontium, SR, right? Yes. Now, out of that, what's the most active metal? Is it going to be the, what, the little one or the big one? The little one, most active metal? Oh, big one, because it's losing. And keep track of that. I'm just I'm pulling off an electron when it's a metal, right? Cool. I'll, I'll do that. I'll just jump up there. So strontium is bigger than calcium is bigger than magnesium. 
Potassium is bigger than calcium, bigger than gallium. Is that what you thought? Potassium is the biggest. And then sulfur is bigger than chlorine, which is bigger than fluorine. You see that little curve? So sulfur number 16 is the biggest. And then if I was to ask which is the most active out of this, these are non-metals now. Which one would this be? Fluorine. Fluorine. Yeah. Good. Good stuff. All right. Okay. Get your calculators out. We'll do a little bit of calculation. We'll see how we do we get through this slide. So <clears throat> we're going to talk about this thing about the mole. We're going to go through the mole. But remember, I'd already talked to you about, like, if you look on the bottom of something up here like carbon, we say it weighs 12.011 atomic mass units. That's useless. I can't do anything with that. So what I have to do is I have to gather, like, just for example, an AMU weighs... 1.66 e to the minus 24 grams. So that's useless, right? It's, I can't, I can't weigh 12 of those when they're that small. Because this is the best scale I've got. It really weighs it out to right e to the minus five. Use your phone. I can't weigh this. Are you with me? So what we do is how many protons before you get to a gram? So this is something you can do yourself if you say, okay, if every proton weighs this, right? And I, So that means this, one proton is this many grams, right? So I'm wondering what one gram would have in terms of protons. So I'm going to do what we, we learned early, early in here where we said, okay, I got one proton. Oh, I'm sorry. One gram, that's what I'm after, correct? And I'm asking how many protons? True? Mm -hmm. so I need a conversion, which puts what on the bottom and what on the top? Protons. Protons. And I actually have it right here. Oh, one proton is that many grams, okay. 1.66, 10 to the minus 24. So I just got to do that math. Anybody have a calculator that could go 1 divided by, so here's a chance to use your scientific notation, right? 1.661, and then use whatever key you got, and then what should I put in? Negative. Negative 24 equals, right, and see what comes out. What are you guys getting as an answer? Six. Six yeah. point zero two. Zero two times ten to the twenty third. Twenty third. That's what's called Avogadro's number. This is what we did. And what does it mean? It means if I take the very smallest atom I have, or smallest particle I have, and I gather it up that much, it would weigh one gram. So I could actually. Why don't I just use do everything I can with that unit? Yeah. Yeah, so here's what happened. Let's try it one more time. One <coughs> divided by, and let's, so what we're going to do is we're going to just enter 1.66e to the minus 24. So that's how you do the negative 20. Negative one. And you can just use your scientific notation like that. To do the negative 24. And then so with the other conversions, what is going to be that in? We're missing the EE. Uh, follow? Yeah. Okay. But just in case you spot bugging you later in the night, what happened? Here's what happened. It took 1 times 10. Because of order of operations, it took 1 times 10 to minus 24 and left it on top and divided by that on the bottom. That's why it came out. 
Good stuff. This is called a mole. All right. So if you gather up a mole of something, I can actually now measure it on the scale. So in chemistry, we always work in moles. You with me? So mole is an animal. Now, don't you see 6.02 times 10 to the 23? So for this class, you should know this number. It's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. It's a mole. It's what we measure things in. It's abbreviated little MOL. And I, I just, this always cracks me up. Like I saved all sorts of time by cutting off the E, like hours, right? Whatever. There's lots of little things. You know, I've got some stuff on here on YouTube if you want to get, you know, on and on and on, all these ways to remember the mole. It's a chemist dozen. It's how many? It's, how, it's a count. Don't forget that. It's a lot of pieces. 12 counts a dozen, correct? A dozen is a count. Right? A pair, that's two. That's a count of two. Does that make sense? Same idea. So, I'm going to show you how to start doing some conversions off the table where I can kind of convert between number of pieces, moles, and grams. Now, I'm not going to get too caught up in this part. I'm going to more focus down here. This is what I'm more concerned for you guys because this is pretty common in chemistry. I want you to know how to get from moles to grams and grams to moles. And let me tell you why. Let, let's just make some sense out of this. If I do some sort of chemistry and say, okay, I'm going to make water. And here before long, I'm going to show you exactly what I'm doing here. But basically, the recipe says, and we started on this, right? We did this, what, like this applies to these. They're bound to each other. In the structure, there's two of these hooked together, right? That all making sense? So two hydrogens and one oxygen needed to make two waters, correct? But when I go to measure hydrogen, I have a mass on the bottom. This is not mass, this is how many? This is moles. So this I know. Two moles of this, one mole of that will make two moles of that. But I can't measure moles because I don't have a bolometer. I actually have to go to the mass. So I gotta be able to convert between moles and mass. And then I can do my chemistry. If I knew the, you know, how much does two moles weigh? That's basically what I would be saying. And so here's what, here's the connection. If I know the number of moles, I can turn it to mass using molar mass off the table. Okay, so we're gonna start with simple stuff first. You ready? <coughs> how many grams are in one mole of iron? So this is real simple, because if I look at iron, look at the bottom number, it's 55.84 grams in every one mole. So this one's as easy as it gets. But the setup is the same. You see what I did? Hey, I know I got one mole. I know that mass on the periodic table is how many grams per mole? 55.85 grams per mole. That would cancel and give me grams. Hmm. But, you know, kind of says the same thing. Right? But the idea is going to be the same. So now if I needed to do this reaction where silver nitrate hit iron, it makes silver fall out. This is actually a cool reaction. This is like photographic solutions, like your old school phot photographer, that stuff you dip that. That's this. If I drop the coat hanger in it, it would drop the silver back out and leave this in solution. Oh, that's cool. I, I'll do that for you. I'll do that. Because I got a hanger, right? It's right there. I just need a little silver nitrate. I'll show you how to pop silver out of solution. You with me? And again, a mole is how many? Okay, let's do something that's a little harder. Now I've got four grams of iron. How many moles? Same idea. What do I have? 
four grams of iron. I want to turn it into moles. So I set up my conversion factor such that what's on top, what's on the bottom, and then I just make it true. 55.84, I'm just looking on the variety table, right? 55.85 grams per one mole. And I cut that down a little bit. Then the, then the calculator work is four divided by that number. Follow? And the answer is, let me sell some room work. Four divided by 55. Is that what you guys are getting on your calculators? Four divided by that? Somebody else confirm yeah. that? Yeah, okay, good. Get some. They concur. Sound like we're in, I like that. Sounds like we're in a courtroom. So I concur. Yeah. <laughs> Seven on this one, you put the one mole on top, and then on the bottom, you put the one mole on top. Yeah, so. It depends what you're starting with, because I want you to go either way. If you know the number of moles, go to grams. If you know the number of grams, go to moles. So it's just, it depends what you're starting with. It's really good that you pointed that out. Oh, okay. Yep. So this is what I start with. This is where I'm ending. And here, you know, here in a minute, we're going to do this, right? I don't know why I'm asking you that. Oh, I see what I'm saying. Oh, I, I now I get what I'm saying. Hey, by the way, if it's iron or iron three plus, remember that are losing electrons, and electrons are massless, so it doesn't matter. The same calculation applies whether it's charged or not charged. If I'm doing iron three plus or I'm doing iron, same thing applies. Make sense? Nothing different. Okay, now we're going to practice, and this will, this will kind of get you going. So I now have the mass of sodium, now I'm going to turn it to moles. In this other problem, I have the moles or something, now I'm going to turn it to mass. So based on which way you're going, you're going to put your factor in there. So our, our goal is this, we're going to convert this to moles, convert that to mass, and then what do I have to do with this first before I turn it to moles? Turn it, turn it to grams, then turn it to moles. Good. Just a little reminder on that one. Get this down pat. Ready to go. Help or let me I'll kind of kind of peek at your setting setups a little bit. So now you're ready to start on this one. Two point three over even with four. 
or a medicine or an answer. So go ahead and put the times in before you know what that means. Two point nine nine. Huh? No, no. Ella te, ya te dio el este. You're repeating it. You know, you shouldn't repeat it. This is already what it's worth. So this will be six point two times ten to the negative twenty three. So be that. So it's not, we're not it's using not, the mass on that? So it's, that is the weight. The atomic mass is the grams. So then what's the first thing? What's that? Like the 2.308? That's the, that's the grams of that amount of um, what sodium. Is sodium. Okay. So we're trying to find out how many moles this is. So it's a thousand moles because it's way bigger. It's a, it's way more. Okay. Yeah. So this, yeah. So this amount of grams mm -hmm. is. We're trying to get that to moles. So the moles of okay. grams Na is that twenty-two point nine. Okay. Okay. Let's do sodium first. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's confusing. <laughs> so you had it right the first time. Sodium, we know 2.30 e to the 4, and I just want to remind you guys, this is not the mathematical E, that's a shortcut for scientific notation. It means that, which could also mean move the decimal over four times. One, two, three, four, right? That's the same thing. Everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. So I'm starting with that many grams, and I want to end up in moles. So I set things up so the grams cancel and moles is on top. And then I just look at sodium and it says, ah, 22.99 grams per one mole. Take that, divided by that. Tracking? Yep. One, eight, and three. Mm -hmm. You guys come up with a thousand in essence? Yeah, that, right? Kind of like divided by 23. So now this one's going to be a little different because you're starting with moles. So I got 3.0 moles and I got to come out with grams so I'm going to do the opposite. I want moles to cancel. Put grams on top. It's phosphorus. 30.97. Just a quick note, just this might help you a little bit. Because this has three significant figures, when I write off the table, I'll just write one more. That way this doesn't change the sig figs. Just that'll semi help you for quizzes, tests, and that's how I always do these things. I don't need all the digits because it wouldn't help me. Just have one more than what's given. When I get it off the top. Okay, so this times that should be the answer. So somewhere around 90, right? 93, something like that. 9.29 e to the 1. Move the decimal over once, 93, 92.9. Check. Same thing here, only it's got two conversions. 
can do, do them all together or do them in two steps. 253 centigrams of nickel. So I want to go to grams. What should be on top? Grams and centigrams on the bottom. How many centigrams in a gram? And then, in essence, I can just shortcut say, oh, I'm in grams now, and I need to go to moles, so I can just keep going. This is the element nickel. And nickel is 58.69. This divided by 100 divided by that. Although I did, that's where the conversions come in handy handy. 4.31e to the minus 2. People agree? That's it. <laughs> 